Hi everybody. Today I want to talk about some high level strategies related to data sufficiency questions. Now for anyone who's just starting off on the GMAT, I know that data sufficiency may seem like it's a very intimidating question type, but I promise you as you start to dive in more and learn more about the math topics on the GMAT, data sufficiency really isn't going to be the worst question type you face. In fact, I'm very confident that you're going to start to enjoy doing data sufficiency questions as hard as that is uh, to see right now. What I want to chat about today is a mixture of the strategies behind data sufficiency questions, what they're testing, and how this can help you almost guess better when you see a harder data sufficiency question that you don't understand, but also create a safeguard so that if you're putting a particular answer, you're always thinking about why you're putting that answer in data sufficiency. So what I want to start with is the purpose of a data sufficiency question, and, and this is reflected on the GMAT as a whole, that when you put an answer in a data sufficiency question, you have to understand that the GMAT is always testing you on something. And they're never going to give data sufficiency questions away for free, and they really, really don't want you to guess appropriately uh, in a data sufficiency question or get lucky with your guesses. Because remember, the minute you get lucky with your guesses is the minute that they can't actually give you this test to decide if you're worthy of certain business schools. Because then there doesn't take any skill in getting the questions right. Your guess is usually going to be the correct answer and thus it's going to invalidate what they're testing on the GMAT. So before getting into uh, these appropriate guessing strategies and strategic approaches, we can easily do this question out. So what we see is what is the value of x over y? Well, we can rewrite x over y to say x over y equals what? And then we can dive right into statement one, which we'll do below our answer choices. Now in statement one, we see that x is 2y. Now in a vacuum, x being 2y means you don't, um, you don't know y and you don't know x. And the issue with that in a vacuum, or not the issue, is simply that it wouldn't be enough to solve for x and it wouldn't be enough to solve for y individually. But the question isn't saying what is x or what is y. The question is saying what is the value of x over y. So hint number one in a question like this is make sure you know that the question isn't just saying plain old what is x, what is y, but they're asking you for something more specific. Why is this important? Well, because when you take 2y and you sub it in for x, you get 2y over y, and you'll notice right away that the y's cancel and you're left with 2. Now, what's interesting is this is enough to solve for the question, even though looking at statement 1, it appeared like it wasn't going to be enough information. Now, quickly, if we look at statement 2, we realize that y being 4 is not going to be enough because then we're going to be left with simply x over 4 and that's not a value. So the answer to this question is A, but more importantly I want to talk about the strategy behind this question and really what the GMAT is testing in this question and then we're going to move on to one that's slightly harder. The GMAT, as I said, they're never going to make these problems guessable. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if I was a very unexperienced test taker, GMAT test taker, or if I gave this question to a very inexperienced GMAT test taker, they would look at this question and they would probably guess that the answer is C. Now, why would they guess that? Well, they'd guess it because we're given that Y is 4 in statement 2, and we're given that X is 2Y in statement 1. So, you know, on the surface, it looks like, oh, this is great. I can take 4, I can plug it in for Y, and then I can say that X is 8, and of course, Y is 4. Well, here's the problem with that. The problem with that is that that's too easy. It's just too easy. And the GMAT, as we know, is never going to test us uh, or allow us to guess that easy. So the minute that you see that the answer could be C without you doing any work, you want to stop yourself and you want to say, wait a minute, is that really the answer? And if we look at it that way, think about all the answer choices. We have in data sufficiency, we have A, 
we have B, we have C, we have D, and we have E. So if we're taking this approach and we say, all right, the trap answer here is definitely C. There's no way the GMAT is just going to give me x equals 2y, give me y is 4, and say, yeah, that's what we need to solve. So what I mean by that is we can in, it, it eliminate C without too much thought whatsoever because we know that there's no possible way the GMAT is going to make that the right answer. So with that said, then you can say to yourself, well, if we know that C would have worked if it came down to it, even though that's not the correct answer here, that means E definitely isn't an option. So we've already eliminated two answers. Now, that leaves us with A, B, and D. Well, the reality is if you look at statement two and you see that Y is four, clearly that on its own is not enough to give us a value of X over Y. So we eliminate B. And now we're left with A and D, and we know it can't be D because we've already eliminated answer choice B. So again, we're left with answer choice A. Now, let me stress that I'm not telling anyone that this is the method I always want you to take in data sufficiency, but I am saying there's always a rhyme and a reason to what the GMAT is testing in these questions. Clearly doing it out didn't take too long but in the back of your mind, understanding the concepts behind what they're asking and what they're testing is going to be extremely important for your success, especially if you're looking to break into the 700s. Now, I want to do one more question here, and I want to use these same skills, and I want to do something backwards. I actually want to do the guessing strategy first, and then we're going to go and we're actually going to solve the question second. So let's say we have our answer choices listed out. And we think about it from the standpoint of what is the GMAT testing. Now, this problem reads, if n and x are positive integers, is n divisible by 3? Okay, so we can at least write that out. So is n over 3 equal an integer? Well, let's keep in mind the GMAT is not going to give us this question on a silver platter. They're not going to make it so this is guessable. So right away, I look at the two statements and I say, all right, well, Statement two, they're giving me x. Statement one, there's an equation with an n and an x in it, which means if I were to just go ahead and plug three in for x and then for x cubed, I would know n, which means I would be able to say whether or not n is divisible by three. That's where you want to stop and say, wait a minute, too easy. And just based off of that, I can eliminate c. And for the same logic in the pre as we used in the previous question, because we know C theoretically could work, E is out. Now, we go to statement two, X is three. Well, notice in the question itself, is N divisible by three? There's not even an X in it. So there you go, B is out. Because B is out, D has to be out, and we're just left with A. Now, what's crazy is we did that without any really extraneous work. We were just doing it based off of principles of data sufficiency and principles of what the GMAT is testing in data sufficiency questions. Now, to stress this again, I don't think you can do this in every and all data sufficiency questions, but in questions that are algebraic in nature, a lot of times thinking about it this way will work and also give you a leg up. But I still think that going about this question a regular way is still a great way to do the question. I think it's still very efficient and it won't leave you with any doubt. So let's do that real quick. Statement one says n equals x to the third minus x. All right, well, we know that we can factor out an x squared, giving us, or excuse me, not an x squared, but just an x. So we'll get rid of that squared sign. And when we do that, we get x squared minus one. Now keep in mind this is all equal to n. We know that x squared minus one is a difference of squares, so we can say x plus one, x minus one. And then this is interesting. What this is actually telling us is that x is a, or excuse me, n is a product of three consecutive integers. Because you have an x, you have a value that comes right before x, and a value that comes right before, right after x. So something like 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 4, 10, 11, 12, et cetera, et cetera. What's interesting about three consecutive integers 
is that if you pull any three consecutive integers you want, you'll notice that at least one of those integers will have at least one prime factor of three in it, which means that those that the product of those three consecutive integers will always be divisible by three. And with that said, we know that the answer here is A, as we proved before. Of course, statement two does not work because there's no talk of N in statement two, and we need to know if N is divisible by three. So in conclusion here, this is a great way to start thinking about data efficiency. I can tell you from experience that if you think like the test makers, you're going to set yourself up to have safeguards when perhaps you're falling into a trap or perhaps you're doing something too easily in a data efficiency question and it's going to save you some points on the test and some accuracy on the test.